Hi everyone. Once again, my name is Vanessa Joseph. I am your elected city clerk. If you're a resident or a stakeholder here in the city of North Miami, it's a pleasure for me to have this workshop and to see all of you here today because I think that the subject of community benefits agreements is extremely important and people have actually been trying to figure out how do I get involved in the development process and this is one of the ways that you can do that. And I think it's extremely important that people not just sit here, take the information and leave with it, but actually start to look at your neighbors who are in the room and start having conversations about how do we come up with a coalition where we can take this on and be part of the development process before it even begins. Uh, Mr. Cornell Cruz here is going to go over this in much more detail and tell you what a community benefits agreement actually is. Unfortunately, Camilo Mejia could not be with us today. He is sick, and so Cornell is going to fill in for him. We also have John Lorfis from the city of North Miami, who's going to talk to us a little bit about how businesses even come here. And Debbie Love, we all know as our beloved city planner for the city of North Miami, who does the best that she can with what she has to really make things happen in the city while also keeping in mind what the residents are looking for and what they want. But of course, if your voice is not heard, the city doesn't have information to go on, the city doesn't have information to go on. So just to, so you all know what's on your table, there is a community benefits worksheet. And the point of this worksheet is for you to take down notes about maybe some of the things that are important to you, what you would like to see in the city. And if you can, if you're going to leave early for any reason, just please fill it out, leave it on the sign in table. Gertie, Roberto are back here and they'll collect it from you. This helps to identify for the different departments what things are important to you, what are some of your values. There's a notepad on the if you need it, there are post-it notes. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask the panelists, we'll try to save time for that at the very end. Of course, there's a pen, there are snacks, so please uh, fill yourselves up because nobody's taking it home. Uh, thank you all so much for once again being here, and I hope that this is extremely informative to you. It is being recorded. I will be distributing it if they let me. And so... <laughs> And so without further ado, I um, pass it on over to the panelists. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, everyone. My name is Cornell Cruz, Jr. Glad to be here. I am the executive director of the Community Reinvestment Alliance of South Florida. Um, correction, Community Reinvestment Alliance of Florida, we just became a statewide organ membership organization. Um, we are a nonprofit, and our mission is to ensure that the banks adhere and all financial institutions adhere to the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977. The Community Reinvestment Act of 1977 um, regulates that every financial institution that's that is regulated and registered in the United States of America must reinvest in low to moderate income communities um, throughout, their, throughout their existence. So we have, at this particular time, we have 3,953 banks. Um, and that's about to go down by one um, due to a, due to TD Bank is going to be purchasing First Horizon Bank and we are also going to be doing the community benefits agreement for that uh, particular bank. Um, we have participated in six community benefits agreements with financial institutions totaling over $200 million. Um, we've also participated in community benefits agreements with developers and the cities and counties um, in the state to help provide a better uh, a, a better investment within the uh, within the communities. So we have a little bit of of uh, experience at doing this. So it's important that, that you're here today, and I'm glad that you're here today because there's nothing about having a community benefits agreement without the community. The community is 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 important, and they need to have a voice in what goes on, what's being built, what's being developed. Um, and how that go and how to go about helping um, the uh, developers and be a part of this of this uh, uh, of each community and what they bring to the community. We'll just begin by talking about CBAs um, and how they came about and um, give you a little knowledge about community benefits agreements. So, as you can see up there, um, CBA history has arisen from historical context of struggles from community groups developers and public officials 
over the nature of development projects. And as you know, here in Florida, particularly in South Florida, there's a development project going up every five minutes. Uh, there's very seldom that there's a blade of grass that is just, that doesn't have something on it if it's not considered a park. So it's important that we be involved with these CBAs and how the developers uh, want to use that particular land. Um, public agencies are involved because a significant role of government subsidies play in the development process. As you well know, a lot of your tax dollars are used, or our tax dollars are used um, to incentivize developers. Um, and that comes from the city or county government or municipality. Um, developers often receive subsidies in the form of tax incentives, abatements, infrastructure development, land procurement. Um, because public officials are eager to encourage growth within their jurisdictions. And I don't know of, a, of, of any city, county, or municipality that doesn't want to see growth in their community. So that's an important part of it. Next slide. So context of CBAs. A CBA is a contract created by the key partners involved in community development projects. And one thing that has to be emphasized here, the key partners. You are the, or we as a community are the key partners. Um, this list usually includes private developer, community-based organization, i.e. nonprofits, um, public officials, local government agencies, and the community. And I emphasize the community because it's important that they be a part of these, of these agreements. Uh, these agreements should not be able to go forward without the community's involvement and having a voice in what they want to see. A typical contract defines specific benefits for uh, the developer guarantees to residents of the affected neighborhoods. Um, the benefits can include well-paying jobs, it can afford, include affordable housing, um, child care centers, health, recreational facilities, and educational improvements. And I'm sure as you all know, probably our main thing these days is affordable housing. Um, and being able to live here in, a, in, in, in the city or county that we love. Uh, we're slowly but surely being priced out. Uh, I was just having a conversation with a gentleman earlier and, and in case you haven't seen lately, um, in, in January and February, the rents rose in Miami-Dade County 55%. It's going to be hard to live like that. And the, the, the thing about, about Florida and South Florida in particular is that we don't have a lot of land. You know, we got the Atlantic Ocean on one side and the Everglades on the other side, so where are we going to go? Um, next slide, negotiating CBAs. The process of negotiating the CBA is an expansion of traditional citizen participation framework in which communities express themselves through public hearings, community forums, and other means to include, to up to it and include protesting. This framework has provided a familiar and accepted method of gathering public input on economic development projects and many other issues. And I, some of the ones I pointed out earlier. The negotiation cannot just be a glorified listening session. And I want to emphasize this because this involves, again, the community being involved and not just coming to one listening session and not speaking. Um, and, and putting together CBAs, it's important that the community bring their ideas to the table as well. It is important that city, city, county, municipal officials also listen to the community, and most important that the developers listen to the community and not just pay lip service. That's why it's important for you to participate when you, become, when you, when you get ready to have a community benefits agreement or at least start some type of community uh, benefits uh, uh, um, policy. Again, the community's input must be considered, must be fully considered. Um, next, next slide, community groups. So community groups um, have strived to, to be active partners on the front end of the planning process to ensure that their concerns are addressed. Those CBAs, through CBAs, they have introduced the possibility that conflict can be rechanneled into productive negotiations that will result in an agreement amenable to all concerned parties. Um, as a matter of fact, I was just mentioning to the, the panel up here that we're going through this with a, with a project down in the city of Miami right now, and we're part of an organization that is led by all nonprofits, but that it's all nonprofits that are involved called Public Land for Public Good. And they have 18 acres around in the medical area, around the hospitals that uh, the city wants to develop. And we want to be a part of that, up to and including um, being a part of the, the, uh, the RFP process, the request for proposal process. 
So that's an important part of it. We've already held charrettes with the community and told the city what the community wants. So it's important that these community groups are formed. Next slide. Opportunities and challenges. There's always going to be opportunities and challenges. Anytime you get a group of more than one person together, there's always going to be different, differing point of views. So layering in among the opportunities and challenges of CBAs are some unknowns. For example, there are unanswered questions about the durability and the long-term effectiveness. That can be a challenge. If, if the community does not stay in, involved in that, in that CBA, in other words, you can't just come in and put together a CBA, sign a contract, and think that's the end of it. The community has to stay involved. The community has to be a part of the monitoring process and has to be a part of what's being done and not being done. Um, will the terms of the agreement be complied with? Um, will an unanticipated factors intervene, i.e., um, if, if, if developers are working on a project and they find something unexpected under there, like it, it's a brownfield or something that they didn't expect to find, then that may hold up the process or entirely change the process. Um, will the enforcement mechanisms work? Again, that in, that having the community there and having the community to be a part of the monitoring process is, is crucial, is absolutely crucial. To the extent will low-income neighborhood residents benefit? This is something that cannot be ignored. Um, low to moderate income folks um, have to be a part, of the, a part of the process and it's been my experience that a lot of low to moderate income um, folks in the community believe they have no voice. But collectively, we do have a voice. Collectively, we do. It's, going to hard, be, it's hard to do it individual, as individuals, but collectively, we have a voice. That's why it's so important to form those coalitions. I'm going to talk a little bit about coalitions um, later. Um, will the entities on the community side work together to achieve a shared goal? All part of building the, building the coalition. One thing about a coalition, some folks think that a coalition, everybody has to agree on everything. There is no such animal as everybody agrees on everything. So local development climate is favorable, and it seems to be in South Florida that the development climate is always favorable. Um, but the environment is open to bargaining. Public subsidy is substantial. Community um, derailing power is great enough to justify developers and me developers meeting advocates' demands rather than resisting them and declining to invest. Now, I'm, I'm sure you've all read or been a part of uh, a, an agreement and the person said if they didn't give what they want, they just walk away. Um, we don't want to see that in any, part, in any development, in any part of the city or the county, in particular um, our city of North Miami, we don't want to see that. What we want is, is for the community, developers, and government to work together in order to ensure that everybody's represented and everybody, and everybody has a piece of that pie. Uh, communities interested, interests will be well represented. Again, the community has to stay involved. Um, parties to the CBA represent the interest of the community. Coalitions advocating for CBA faithfully uh, represent stakeholders. And the process is, is inclusive, transparent, accessible, and addresses real community needs. Okay, again, it goes right back to working together and everybody in the coalition um, having a voice and everybody in the coalition being willing to negotiate and willing to compromise. The politics of CBAs and organized labor are well connected. Organized labor politics when bound with CBA uh, politics supports CBA efforts including efforts outside the immediate domain of the workplace and the collective bargaining agreement. So organized labor is, is also a, a great big part of this because as you, as you build, as a developer comes in and he wants to build something, he or she wants to build something, you want them to also provide well-paying jobs, particularly in your community or residents of your community. Um, there is a key partnership with local government even CBAs may not, need, may, may not need the involvement of the local government. government backs deals have shown to be more likely to succeed because we expect the government to hold their feet to the fire and hold them accountable. Um, so, and I can guarantee you they're going to need something from government, always. There's no such thing as this. I could just go out and throw up, throw up anything on a blade of grass. I have to involve the government in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Size and nature of the project are conducive. CBAs are big projects in emerging markets and more likely to succeed. Now, um, one of the things about 
just our area in general is that there's not a lot of places left to do gigantic projects other than to go up, right? So uh, um, we have to be mindful of that as well. CBAs can, that can be uh, enforced and monitored properly. Enforcement mechanisms are clearly defined in the, to assure accountability, and the coalition is affiliated with larger established nonprofits. They have strong bargaining power. Nonprofits don't just do don't just do that. The, the, one of the, the best the best things about nonprofits is bringing the the community together in order to fight for a specific cause. Okay, so the nonprofits can the nonprofits can make sure the coalition stays strength stays strong, but the people participating in the coalition have to participate, and they have to participate on the regular. This can't again I say it will not this cannot be something that can be one and done. This cannot be something that you can do once, you go to one meeting, and then that's the end of it. It's a continuous thing where you have to make the time. Money and resources are available to the community. Communities can afford and support negotiating costs, meetings, research reports, and so on. For instance, what we did with the PL PLPG group, Public Land for Public Good, in Miami, is we actually got a grant in order to conduct those charats and conduct those community meetings so we actually got a grant in order to do that. And communities have negotiation resources, technical, legal assistance. There are several nonprofit or nonprofits that, that provide uh, uh, legal assistance that can explain the where to's and how do's and all that kind of stuff. Um, one in particular is, is, is the is Community Justice Project down in Miami, led by Lena Greer. They do that quite well. Next slide. Um, building a coalition, a community coalition. A coalition is a group of individuals and organi organizations with a common interest who agree to work together towards a common goal. Please understand it's not, that it's not, an it's not something that everybody agrees. Agrees is not in, even in the, in the definition. It's not that everybody agrees, but everybody agrees to come together for a common goal. Now, we may have different ways of getting to that. We, may have this, we probably all have the same common goal, but we may have different ways of getting to that goal or different suggestions for getting to that, for getting to that goal. Part of that being a part of a coalition means that you, you can bring your ideas to the table. Um, and if your idea is not accepted, that's not the time to take your ball and run home. It's to work with the others in the group in order to ensure that the coalition is successful. Next slide. Why start a coalition? Well, to address a current, usually it's to address an urgent situation, hurricane, health crisis, or a housing crisis. And that's what we're in, sitting right in the middle of right now, is a housing crisis. We're sitting, not, not, just for the pur not just purchasing, but also renting. So we're sitting right in the middle of a housing, uh, a housing crisis. So everything that goes up, every development, every project, um, for me, it is important that housing be included in some way, shape, form, or fashion. I'm a firm believer that housing is a right for everyone. So, and everybody might not agree with that. However, but however, we housing is crucial to everybody's existence at this particular time. Um, to empower elements of the community or the community as a whole, take control of its future. Um, city and county residence boards, CRA boards, business bureaus, and so on. So everybody's interest is included. So it's, it, in a coalition, you want to bring everybody to the table from all different parts of the community so they, everyone has a voice. Actually obtain and provide services to take a coalition either initially or over the long term to design, obtain funding for, and or run a needed intervention in the community, um, i.e. food banks, transportation, child care, and so on. To bring about more effective and efficient delivery programs, delivery programs and eliminate unnecessary duplication of effort. Um, and let me say this, I've, I've been a part of several projects and community, community uh, involvement where uh, certain organizations try to divide and conquer. Meaning that even if, you're a, even if we have a coalition, they'll reach out to individuals in that particular coalition to try to offer them something to walk away from, from the rest of the coalition and, or, or try to influence what goes on in the coalition. Um, once you, you, you have, that, you have that, that agreement to stand together, you have to stand together. 
Um, it can easily, it can, uh, a coalition, I've seen several that, have, that, have, that, have, that this has happened to, a coalition can easily be broken by dividing and conquering. So um, once, and as a matter of fact, when we, when we do our uh, bank, uh, our CBAs with financial institutions, we actually sign an agreement that we will not be negotiating outside of the, outside of the, the whole negotiation for the, for the uh, organizations. So that way we, we, we also know that we can't, we can't be divided so we can be conquered. So that's a very, very important part of building any coalition. Next slide. So burials and obstacles. Turf issues. Organizations are often very sensitive about sharing their work and their target populations, especially their funding. And that's usually among the nonprofits. We've gotten a whole lot better at being at teamwork and working together here in, here in Miami-Dade County. There was a time back in, in the early 2000s where we didn't do that. It was a, it was a cut, uh, I'm sorry to be so graphic, but there was a cutthroat situation among the nonprofits. And it got very, very bad. But I, I think over the last five years, eight years, we've got come, really come together um, as far as teamwork is concerned and working together so that we can ensure that the whole community. As a matter of fact, most, most grants um, these days require some sort of teamwork, some sort of, uh, of teamwork amongst organizations in the community. So we've gotten better at it. Um, bad history, organizations, individuals, or the community as a whole may have had experiences in the past that convinced them that working with certain others or working together all is simply not possible. Um, let me be honest, there's, there's certain people that I don't like, but that doesn't stop me from working with them. Okay. The, the, the overall mission for the community is the most important thing, not my personal feelings, or what, they, what I believe they did in the past, or what I believe they did not do in the past. So um, I, think, I think we have to take everyone by, uh, on face value and try to come together, especially when we're trying to do something important that's important to the community. Domination. Domination by professionals or some other elite. All too often, agency people with advanced degrees, local politicians, business leaders, and others, in a rush to solve problems to help the disadvantaged, neglect to involve the people most affected. Um, that is a big deal for me as well. Um, we love, we have a tendency to love to tell people what they need and not ask them or not ask, not ask them to be a part of the situation so they can be a part of uh, saying what they need. Um, it's important that those people are the ones who talk about the needs of the community. If you, need, if you need daycare, if you need jobs in the community, if you need housing in the community, the people who are having the problems doing those things are the ones who need to speak, not those who come from the outside thinking they know what the community needs. You know, that irks me more than anything. It, it, I hate for people to tell me what I already know, and I hate people for the, to tell me what I need. Only I can articulate that, and that goes with the community. Only the community can articulate what they need. Um, poor links to the community. The first step is to have, have to be the development of, of the non-existent relationships among agencies and communities at large. Again, um, I think the nonprofits have done a great job of working together um, here in, here in Miami-Dade County and, and the city of North Miami. I think they've done a great job of working together and that's all, that's very, very important so no one is left out. And, um, and it's not to say that it's all covered. Of course it's not. Um, there's always going to be other organizations that need to come in, and we would hope that those organizations would be, would be willing to partner and be able to come in and talk about um, the needs of their particular people, the particular part of the community they serve. Um, next slide. Continue with barriers and obstacles. Minimum organizational capacity. It might be necessary to find a coordinator um, or for one, on one or more individuals of organizations to find a way to share the burden of organization. Again, we've, and as far as the Public Land for Public Good Coalition, um, we have 36, 36 organizations that are part of that, um, that coalition. And we all work together because no, no one can, can do all this work alone. So it's important that we all try to work together and, and spread out the work amongst everyone. Funding. New coalitions have to be alert to funding possibilities from all quarters, also have to be vigilant about the kind of funding they apply for. Again, as I told you before, we didn't, we, with the Public Land for Public Good group down in Alapata, we didn't, um, 
we actually found a grant that helped us put together the Shawats in order to bring the community together. And there's, there are funding possibilities out there. Um, failure to provide and create leadership within the coalition. Um, everyone can't talk at the same time. We, although you encourage everyone to, to speak, everyone can't speak at the same time. You start talking over each other. That's why leaders have to be elected um, and be determined about who's going to lead the organization and how they're going to lead a meeting. Um, as with anything, you know, you can't go in organized chaos, especially when it comes to community benefits agreements. Organized chaos does not work. Does not work. And the organization needs, has to have a clear message and a clear speaker that can articulate that particular message. Perceived or actual cost of working together outweigh the benefits of, for many coalition members. The task here may be to find ways to increase benefits and decrease costs for the individuals and organizations whom um, for whom this is the case that the coalition is to, is to survive. Um, I think that some, some people as part of our coalition always want to be all, provide all the talking points. Uh, and then that, that also tamps down others, where others won't speak. Um, and that's, again, that goes back to leadership, but I think uh, it can be done. Um, it's just a matter of egos cannot get in the way and um, um, the participation has to be has to be uh, has to be from everyone. So no one should be able to should should come in and just sit at a meeting and not express themselves. Everybody should be encouraged to express themselves. I'm one of those that if if I if I'm leading if I happen to be leading the coalition, I'll start calling out people if they're not if they hadn't said anything because I want to hear from them and what they have to say is good, is probably important. They probably got a great idea. They just haven't articulated because. Someone is, 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 is taking up all the airtime. So it's important that, that, that it becomes equal. It, it's important that you know that if you participate in something like this, that you have a voice and, and you are, are obligated in order for this, the coalition to be successful, to, be, to raise your voice. Next slide. So how do we start a community coalition? Um, put together a core group, a group of individuals with knowledge of the issue at hand, who can articulate a vision and a mission for the group, which merely means what the coalition seeks to accomplish and how. Um, identify potential coalition members, um, reaching out to different folks in the community, stakeholders, leaders in the community, um, and most of all, those people who are, who, walk around, who are in the community and walk around the community and not afraid to express themselves. I'm sure you've all been to a city, a city meeting and you've had those type of folks, right? And so, yeah, I can hear by the snickering. So, but those people are important. Those people are important because they're not afraid to express themselves and say what needs to be said. As uh, long as we do it in a respectful way, I think any, any idea or any uh, opinion can be put across. Um, recruit coalition members. Um, and that, again, that recruiting folks from the community, um, stakeholders, as well as folks that are directly affected by what's going to happen. That's important. Those folks that are directly affected by, by, by what's going to happen or what this development may be or what the project may be need to be a part of that coalition. Um, next slide. Plan and host the first meeting, and it could be anywhere. It could be here, for instance, or it could be at someone's house. It could be in a park. It could be anywhere. But the first thing to do is to get started, right? Um, you can't knock down that door if you don't first knock first. Um, discuss and agree on the action plan. And again, everybody needs to contribute to that because, uh, yeah, there's a standard action plan that you can work, that you can work from. However, it's important that the community uh, has a voice in how that action plan is articulated, how it's executed, and who's going to speak what when. And then to decide upon next steps, um, include the next meeting, plan to follow up with each member of the coalition, um, and other means, any, other, any communication means that, you, that the group decides is, is, is the best way to do that. So uh, that concludes uh, community benefits agreements as well as uh, coalition building. Again, my, na my name is John Lorfields. I'm the Economic Development Director for the City of North Miami. Um, I spend a lot of time working with um, New, new businesses that are interested in coming to the city and existing businesses. Um, today I thought it would be important to kind of share um, what we currently do right now with businesses that are interested in coming here to do work with the city. We have a purchasing code 
um, that calls for a community benefits plan. It's not a community benefits agreement or related to to um, development, but overall businesses that are interested in doing business with the city, um, when they submit bids and they're awarded and these bids are um, over $250,000 that's coming from the city, the proposal would have to submit a plan um, to the city in reference to community benefit. So, um, and this larger conversation I think is definitely important um, for as it relates to development because of the needs of employment um, and other things for the community to have um, a community um, benefits agreement. Just um, within the last two quarters, we've had 142 new certificate of use applications that have come in. Um, businesses are coming in to the city, uh, you know, rapidly. There's there's a lot of things that are happening in the city. Um, businesses coming to the city in different ways. We we live in a very attractive um, sit location here in the city, and. You know, through marketing efforts from the city, local and state tax incentives, um, city and CRA grant opportunities, we have a, a lot of interest um, in development and new businesses coming in. And um, so, yeah, a community benefits agreement would definitely be um, something for the city to consider and discuss. My name is Debbie Love. I'm the city planner. And um, one of the things that I need to step back, I think what's missing here is a little bit of context to this discussion. First, we don't have an ordinance that requires a developer to have a produce a community benefits agreement. That needs to be the first step that has to occur. Um, you need, we need to have that ordinance in order to even take it to this, to this next stage so we have to start with that. Um, and they can be as simple as, say, for example, St. Pete <clears throat> just adopted one. Again, my apologies for the throat clearing. Um, and it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. It is actually says, um, let me just flip it open, <clears throat> that any development in, in certain areas of the city or certain high-impact developments Philadelphia has an even more simple one. It says any high impact projects or projects in certain areas of the city, they have to negotiate a they have to negotiate a community benefits agreement. And they've laid out in their ordinance, which is what has to occur, you need to lay out in the ordinance what are your minimum standards that you want to be included in a community benefits agreement. Um, and then there has to be some minimums. You should have, at least you should have a baseline. And then you can go into more detail as to what the specific neighborhood may need. It's not that you go and have a coalition of every representative in the city and every resident. They should be, these coalitions, coalitions should be um, specific. Uh, at most, it should, or at the very least, it should it make sure you include representatives of the neighborhood that would be impacted by any specific development coming into the city. So I just wanted to step back and to say that we have to start at that point here in, in our city. Um, other cities have done this, but it's a very complex fee schedule that requires extensive studying. Uh, Florida statute says anytime you're going to charge a fee, you need to have it. It requires meeting what they call a dual rational nexus test. So you need to do a study to justify a fee that you're going to charge to go into a trust fund that could be spent on all sorts of things. The city of Miami had one back in the early 2000s, and when Miami 21 came through, they did away with it. Um, but it was really complex. Uh, so the simpler we can make our ordinance and leave the, the bulk of what happens to the community uh, in that negotiation phase, that coalition that's put together, the better and, and easier it is because then the neighbors are better represented um, versus just simply paying into a fund and then the city decides where that money is spent, where a park would go. Um, and when Currently, what we try to do here in the city now, and I don't know how many of you know this, 
<clears throat> but if they uh, come into the city, there's two types of uh, development. You have as of right development, which means they are not asking for anything at all. They are going to develop according to what the code allows. They're not seeking any sort of subsidy from the CRA. And then you have the, actually there's three types. Then you have, um, we have a lot of overlays that allow uh, developers to come in and request floating density that they would not normally be allowed in their zoning district. Um, for example, in the downtown, it's all commercial, but there's an overlay that actually allows residential. But in order to get any of that development, they have to apply for what's called a conditional use permit. So that conditional use permit does two things does three things. It grants them the allocation of the, the density they're looking for, assuming that it meets the, the bare minimum requirements. It also um, uh, results in a site plan that has gone before community workshop, it's gone before planning commission, and it's gone before city council. So at the end of the day, they have a site plan that um, first we beat them up as staff, um, because we don't, Florida has what's called a, an exactions issue. So you, we have to be very careful of what we ask of any developer coming in that's over and above what uh, the code allows or requires. In a conditional use permit, Florida statute also says you have to pay them whatever the cost is that you're asking them for over and above. Because right now, statute says that if I come in as a developer and you have a failing road already, all I have to do is mitigate my component of that. I don't have to fix your entire failing road. I just have to make sure that the closest intersections to me, um, if, it's a, if a, my development is actually going to cause it to fail, then I have to do something. Otherwise, if it's already failing and it's not going to cause it to fail any further, degrade the level of service, there's nothing we can make them do. Under conditional use permit, we're granting them density that they don't allow. So we are actually paying them for, they're actually getting some benefit for the development. So now we can actually ask for more. So we start asking them for things like, in the public realm, we would like for you to create a little pocket park. We would like for your urbanized area to have seating and shade and make it attractive to folks who are walking by that they can actually, the public can actually enjoy it. So we I actually make them carve out parts of their development project, their site, to accommodate um, public benefits. We don't have anything for let, such as a com, uh, public benefits agreement, but as Planning Commission and the City Council, by the time it gets to them, we've quarter, tried to wring as much out of the developer as we can as far as bringing in what we think are public components. We also look at <clears throat> things such as, um, all right, if you're, uh, although the height is 200 feet, you're next to a residential neighborhood, so you need to transition down, you need to, to, to reduce that. So we can ask them for things that we can't normally. A community benefits agreement <clears throat> would take it to the next phase where we have to, right now we encourage them before they come for final approval to meet with the neighbors to talk with the neighborhood, to see what they, their, their thoughts are on the development project. We can't make them. That's another thing that uh, we would like as staff to have built into the code is a requirement that thou shall meet with the community. And a community benefits agreement would take care of that in, in, in much more of, than a one meeting, right, Cornell? I mean, this would be a major a major shift to meetings with the publics. So we would encourage that. So I'm, I'm talking a little bit off topic from my slide, but I, I thought I want, needed to set a little bit of context for what I want to talk about. So in this community benefits agreement, um, Cornell spoke briefly about how they are negotiated. Um, I alluded to the fact that, that while a coalition is great, it can't be a coalition that's just a standing coalition, at least not in my mind because every neighborhood is so different here. And what a neighborhood, we talked today um, with one of our planning commissions, commissioners in an interview about the lack of park space and how to incorporate park space and more green space into the community. Um, so these type of things need to be more localized to the neighbor. So you create a coalition, but you should be creating a coalition 
of your neighbors and have a nonprofit help you, and this is where I think um, Cornell and I definitely are on the same page, help get a nonprofit to help you organize. He's given you a lot of great information about creating your coalition that you would do to work with the developers um, to ask for what you really want in your neighborhood. It's easier for a, um, a project that has something that we can give them, whether it's CRA subsidies, whether it's density bonuses, then the type of development that comes in that asks for absolutely nothing. They're just doing an as of right development um, because the city cannot be part of that agreement because there's nothing that we're going to give them in exchange for that, those development approvals. However, <clears throat> um, if they say, if the city passes an ordinance says, you're going to negotiate um, privately it would be strictly a, a private agreement between your coalition and be a private contract between your coalition and the developer. So that's where it gets into this whole negotiation piece of it. Um, and <clears throat> we want to, you want to set this up so that at the end of the day, before you get final approval to any of your development projects, that that CBA, which is a contract, it's actually a legally binding contract, and it's enforced, and, and Cornell sort of alluded to the enforcement of it. It depends upon who signs it. So if it's one of those where the city is a partner because we're giving them subsidies, that's a different animal. Then you could have the city as well as the coalition enforce it. Otherwise, um, it would be an enforcement by the coalition group, and that's where Cornell was talking about how important it is not just to sign it one and done, but actually monitor this thing all the way through the end. And it could go beyond the end of construction depending upon what you're asking them for. Because if you're asking them to establish such as um, like in uh, uh, a, another area of the country, <clears throat> they asked for things like um, establishing a pro uh, educational programs. So this goes beyond uh, after construction is, is done. It's monitoring it through all of those negotiated items that you have in that CBA. Um, it really is, and I think my third bullet, uh, sub-bullet under the first bullet is really important. I think that's the most important thing that I see on this page when I put this together. It's really both a process to work towards what you guys as a community would like to see in, your, in the community and the mechanism to enforce both sides of that. Um, so I think that's a key piece for you to take away from anything I say today. Um, next slide, Marla, please. So <clears throat> how does this CBA, how would the CBA relate to uh, development approvals that we give here? Well, it depends, again, whether if, if it's as of right, that's more challenging to, for the city to be involved in it. Because again, it's a private contract. Um, and so the, the, there's no development agreement other than they end up going to building permit or site plan approval before city council. <clears throat> so it could be referenced in the site plan approval for uh, the city recognizes it and says that you have a sign, you've signed this CBA, you signed this agreement. Uh, we understand that as a condition of, I, I don't know, a condition of a certificate of occupancy before that's issued, before you get final site plan approval, that that agreement is enforced, that it has been in place and it's recorded. <clears throat> now, we do have other types of development approvals where we have things like the CRA when they give out money. They're, they call them different names in different uh, configurations. I put some names up here, but they all are the same thing. They're development agreements. It's in another term. So keep that in mind when I talk about development agreements. Here in the cities, it could be like uh, Cornell was talking about incentives. <clears throat> so as part of our incentive, through the conditional use permit, um, that is, that's what I'm talking about here today, is primarily how the city's involvement could be in these private developments when they give some sort of incentive. Um, and part of the conditional use permit, there's two things. One, there is the conditional use permit that gets recorded along with the approved site plan in Miami-Dade County. 
there may be set-aside requirements for affordable housing. So you are going to set aside 15% of the affordable housing, the, the units to meet the 80 to 140%, whatever the CRA has negotiated. We make them sign a restrictive covenant. Those things get recorded and it goes against the title of the property and it travels with the property and not the owner. So subsequent owners are also subject to these and to protect these CBAs, um, they should be recorded as a contract with your development approval. So, um, but again, the big old stick is you have to get this signed and recorded, your CBA, before you get final city approval. Final development approval is subject to that. So, one of the most common things to ask for. Now, I've worked in, uh, as a consultant for many cities around Florida over the years, and I've worked on a few CBAs, not a whole lot, because it really is about mid-2000s these things actually started to become popular. <coughs> A living wage requirement. And now, I, ha, have many of you heard of a living wage? That whole term, living wage, right? Yeah. Well, a living wage, the city doesn't have that, doesn't have an ordinance requiring any of their contractors to uh, offer a living wage. The closest we come, and I saw our housing director step in, but the closest we come is actually when we utilize um, day, um, federal funds for housing development or housing restoration work, then they're subject to the Davis-Bacon Act. And that's pretty broad requirement in Davis-Bacon. It says prevailing wages. So prevailing wages in South Florida may be different than the prevailing wages in Oklahoma. It's not necessarily a living wage. Um, I went to Asheville. Uh, anybody here been to Asheville before? North Carolina? A very, very cool city. Very progressive city. One of the things they did is that all new development coming in has to pay what they term a living wage, but it's $15 an hour flat. So they're home to breweries, brew pubs. Um, I don't know, what do you call those when they have the, the brewery, but you can also, they also have a restaurant and, and yeah, something along those lines, right? Well, they don't accept tips. So the first time I went there, I tried to tip. And the server said, no, 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 we are paid a flat uh, wage. Uh, we're paid $15 an hour, and we don't accept tips. Uh, some of us who waited tables, we probably made more than $15 an hour in tips. But uh, the idea is very progressive. Um, so all developments have to pay that $15 an hour minimum wage, um, especially in the retail sector. And in retail restaurants, it's our lowest, usually lowest wage um, space it, it, that we have in the city as far as paying uh, wages. So um, a living wage isn't, uh, isn't just for those who are oftentimes what you'll see in agreements on living wages is it subject to the contractors for the developer? It's not subject to the tenants in a development that may be mixed use where they have office, they have retail, um, they have restaurants, and so it doesn't extend to the tenants. Uh, and that's where the bulk of the jobs come from, right, is that it comes from those tenants. It's not the construction jobs, they're temporary. Okay. Um, they can actually put it, you can actually negotiate with them with, in your CBA to say, hey, not only do we want a living wage um, for your tenants, that's, there's the little tricky and I'm going to share with you in a moment. It's actually your security, your, your janitorial services that you have for these buildings. Uh, so you can, you can go beyond just that, well, you need to pay construction jobs. Um, you need to pay your own staff. $15 an hour, whoever you contract with for those type of services. Um, a second piece of this would be what's called first source hiring system. It's targeted job opportunities for residents of the community. Could be primarily low income neighborhoods that struggle, um, but it's first source. That's your first, in other words, that's your first source for getting people to work in your, in your um, development. Um, you can have them set up a first source office 
give free rent, to, uh, free space for that sur first source referral. We did something similar to that in Solomia. Um, they actually had an office there where they did some job training. And <clears throat> Cornell said something important. You got to stay with it. You've got to do it, and you got to stay with it, and you have to show up. Um, they would have this workforce training, and people stopped showing up. And so um, we ended up just closing that. So while they did their part, we as the community didn't do our part. Um, people who had the opportunity to show up, they were finding it was more and more challenging to get people to come. Um, but this could be, uh, and one thing that I didn't put here is, um, and I'll share that with you at the end, uh, space for neighborhood serving child care centers, and Cornell mentioned that. Um, we see sometimes in our development proposals that the community has asked, well, one of the thing, one of the uses in, and I think one of our planning commissioners, two of them are back there, former planning commissioner, one of the things that we ask for, or the community has asked for, are daycare centers. So in your mixed use project, can you put in a, 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 a daycare center that could serve not only your residents, but the, the neighborhood as well. Um, construction of parks and rec facilities. This is what we were talking about today, is that we don't have enough park space. And while I can try to squeeze out little bits and pieces here, um, it would be great to have the community say, hey, look, we, want, we need a neighborhood park. We need a, a dog park. We need a people park. We need a green space to go sit and be quiet and just a, a passive area. You would not want an active park next to your residential development, of course, but a passive space that could be zen, could be quiet, could be an enjoyable spot to go, yeah. Um, construction, I say, um, oh, this is another, this is an interesting one. Um, one is, one, this, one example is from here, and one is an example from the city of Key West. Uh, one of the developments had businesses that came in, they have business, existing businesses on the other side of this street that has a lot of on-street parking now. The on-street parking is, is in terrible shape, it doesn't manage stormwater, so they came in and wanted to fix all of that up, but they also added additional on-street parking around the other sides of it that, and that on-street parking cannot be calculated toward their parking requirements, so it's really for the benefit of the existing businesses and for others who want to just use the on-street parking, and it's open to anyone to use. The second one is, um, some of you may be very familiar with this, but my apologies, sorry. Um, is a, that the developer actually sets up a, um, a residential parking area, residential permit parking area. In Key West, has anybody here been to Key West before? You go along Duval Street, right? And then right behind them are all these houses. Well, everybody, they, they don't have their own uh, driveways or garages, um, so they park on the street. So. As developers are coming in, they're requiring developers to actually set up these residential permit um, parking areas, but they go and take it another step forward, uh, further. They say for the first five years, you need to pay for those residents' parking fees, their parking permit, right? And then you also need to pay for the signs that you're going to set up along that area, right? So you've got parking area, residential parking area, you're going to pay for those signs as well. Um, Another one that I think is a really interesting one, and it's sort of had some discussion here on some other development projects, is who's going to come in and, and rent your, your project? What kind of tenants are you going to have in that project? And get involved in um, having some say-so in the tenants that come into the development. And this goes not just the residential tenants, but the, the, the non-residential tenants. For example, if you all say, look, we're in a section of the city that has no grocery stores whatsoever. So we, we would hope that you bring in some sort of grocery store type um, project in there. It could be anything like that. So it's not just your residential tenants, although that's the conversation we've had on other projects. It's really a coffee shop is preferred over um, a veterinarian. I'm just making up something here. Um, 
and we all know the whole issue with affordable housing here. It's, it's no, nothing surprising for any of us here um, to require a percentage of development to have affordable housing, but not just necessarily on-site, but also off-site affordable housing. Um, one of the things that I think um, Cornell mentioned was financing, um, bank financing. But it really isn't just uh, financing a development. It's, it's helping people with down payment assistance. It's helping people to, um, some people don't even have banks in their areas of town, uh, not even an ATM. So the, the banks could help with that as far as bringing in banking systems into it, financial systems. And that could be part of your community benefit agreement that you negotiate. Um, I could talk all day long on this topic, and I'm sure you guys have, have a lot of questions for us. Um, but this is something very uh, near and dear to, to my heart, and I'm hoping that uh, we as a community get together and maybe get an ordinance passed so that we can do this, and then you all develop your coalitions and negotiate your development agreement, your, de your CBA so that we can incorporate it into the development agreements and the development approvals. In the meantime, we hope at a minimum that we can continue to require developers to meet with the community and talk about their development and then react accordingly to what they've heard from the community. Um, with that, thank you, Ms. Joseph. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for our panelists. I hope that the information was useful to all of you, yes? I can't hear you, so I can't, yeah? I think that a lot of what Debbie mentioned are you know, small asks, right? So even a great starting point and maybe low-hanging fruit would be a change in the ordinance, right? So I really encourage you all once again to fill out that community benefits agreement workshop worksheet that is on your table and we'll be collecting them, give it, give it to us before you walk out. And now I'd like to open it up to anybody who has any questions. Okay, uh, wonderful, this is a wonderful meeting. A lot of fantasy land going on here, but Mr. Crew, if I'm uh, not correctly respecting your title, forgive me. Community, all of this, community, community. What is the community? Who is the community? Is the community the cronies of the politician? Is the community the set of people who are chosen, who sit two and three of them on two or three committees? Two or three committees in the city? So you have all these committees, but they're all the same people, mm -hmm. excluding a whole host of other people, of the real grassroots people mm -hmm. so you needed a f I would love uh, my question is oh, excuse me um, what is a community what is community what, who and what is the community the community for me is those people who live in that community work in that community and participate in that community now I, I get what you're saying you have the same people sitting on the same on the same committees but why is that allowed? And let's be frank, okay? If, if I don't lift my voice and I don't go to these meetings and I don't say anything, that's how I get excluded. So it, the community goes two ways. Not just those folks who, 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 uh, who actually make themselves known on the committees, right? But the community of those people who sit back and complain, but don't participate. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Because here in the city of North Miami, there's a rule. You can only speak for two minutes. Okay. That when they open meetings, mm -hmm. uh, they're gonna have community input, mm -hmm. but you can only speak for two minutes. Well, it takes two minutes for me to get my name and my address. Well, I'm, I'm in agreement with I'm you. not finished, I'm not finished. So I get my name and my address, my two minutes up. So you're not, that, that, that you're not really interested in no input from the community or what anyone real has, what a grassroots person, not a clony, not a clony, mm -hmm. what a grassroots person has to say. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm, if I'm wrong, y'all correct me. 
Is there a rule you can only speak two minutes at a meeting here in the city of North Miami? Correct me. Oh, there's nobody saying anything. Okay, Mr. Crew, you can respond to that. Okay, well, I agree with you. In most county meetings, council meetings, commissioner meetings are like that in practically every city because um, I think it's more because they, a couple of things. One, they may not want to hear the truth. Two, two, they want to, they want to keep, they want to tamp down the passion. Three, they want to, they want to keep what's said to a minimum. Okay, but, but, and I agree with you about, about the public speaking, but isn't that why we elect our representatives? Our representatives need to be held accountable and, be, and said what needs to be said for the community. That's why we elect them. And if they don't do what they're supposed to do and they don't communicate what our needs are, we need to fire the happy butts and vote them out. That's, and for me, because I'm totally with you, I, I can't say what I need to say in two minutes either. And I can get, I can get way too passionate I, and, and I get that, but my representative should be able to do that for me. That's why I go. That's why I've elected them in the first place. And if they're not, I'm not voting for them again. I'll put somebody else in there who's got afraid to speak what needs to be said. Let me play off of what Cornell was saying. I look at this different, Miss Alstead. I don't look at this as a standing committee. I look at it as a coalition that's brought together development area by development area. So the neighbors have to be a part of it, the residents have to be a part of it. This is not, I don't envision this. Now Cornell may have a different uh, concept. I don't look at it as a standing committee of any, in any shape or, or form. It is, okay, you know, this development area, it, let's just use Sunkiss Grove. So Sunkiss Grove, we're gonna use Sunkiss Grove as an example. So Sunkiss Grove consists of Alhambra, it consists of some other neighborhoods, and it also has the 7th Avenue corridor. So as developments come in, I envision that they have, you guys have established a coalition uh, for that development area. Um, because what I'm afraid of, and what happens, and I think this is where, if I may, Miss Alston, I think where, where I agree with her, what she's saying, is, if you have a standing committee, it's the same people. Um, and it may not necessarily represent each area of the city. Um, and they may have confl conflicting um, needs. And for me, this is the reason I support this, is that every community is different. Every area of the city is slightly different. The needs are different. There may be some overarching um, sameness, like infrastructure, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, but the needs for park space is greater over there in that side of the city, I'm just using that as an example, than maybe um, closer to Biscayne. So I don't see it, and so I see community uh, groups as a, um, not a standing committee, but that meets for everywhere in the city, but for the development areas. So they meet, they get together, they work on community benefits agree, uh, agreements for every development that may come into that neighborhood. Uh, my name is Gio Darter. I am um, a resident business owner uh, and also a, a, a new developer here in North Miami. I've also been a long-term resident of this uh, city um, over 50 some odd years in and out and I've decided to come back and to bring not only my mission, my foundation, my business and my home to North Miami. I have vested now three years uh, in North Miami getting to know the politics, the mission, the neighbors, and the future of this city. I respect, I know three, two of three of you at the panel, which I respect, uh, I know well. Um, I know that uh, you are, uh, you have a job. You have a job. And you're doing the very best you can with an emerging city um, with a lot of, uh, a lot of obstacles. You, you can't fix it, I know. You can only do your job and do the very best you can and be a catalyst. That is what I am trying to do here in the city as well. I have done every step. I have been patient, I've been courteous, I've been kind, I've been diplomat, uh, diplomatic. I have given my, my time. I have uh, lived by power of example. It is now taking me four years and I'm getting to a point Someone is actually driving somewhere. Will you get there? Please tell me you get there, please. Thank you. 
All right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm going through the process. Again, I am not a big developer. I have a big heart and a big mission and major dreams. Okay? That, that's my, my question again. And I hope that by, I hope within the month, because I'm going to stand still with my permitting, because they come back with stuff that I don't even understand. And I don't have another $30,000 to, I just paid a 32000 impact on just on an arts community center that's going to benefit my neighborhood, that's gonna ha that has art spaces, and where you can't sit down and hear the waterfall, yet they want now flooding and this and that. It's like, okay, another 15000 Where? Where? I just want to get it built so I can have my neighbors come and sit at that park and look at that art piece. Simple as that. Thank you. Well, I, I heard, I heard a, a few things. Um, in reference to your question of uh, local participation um, as a developer, um, recently the city passed an ordinance um, that calls for 20% local participation in reference to a P3 project that the city is working on. So, and the the, the reason behind that is for so a lot of a lot of what you mentioned, um, the big time developers coming in and constantly them being awarded the, the opportunity for these types of project. So the city um, decided to put in, put in an ordinance where when this P3 project would roll out, that um, local participation would be included in that. Does that benefit someone that's trying to take a business or trying to build a community center, trying to build a folder housing, they, the residents, the, the, um, the resident of the city is doing that? How, how does that trickle down to me? Sure, I'm not understanding the question. Well, again, my question was, I need help with. to with my project. Okay. The project that I've invested all my earnings and my savings and my mission for in this town of North Miami. And I'm saying it's taken more than it should. I, it's very difficult to get the support that I need, that I'm looking for more so than what I need. Because once I get it, I, I'm able to implement it. But I'm knocking on doors without getting upset, without calling a name, being diplomatic, you know, biting my tongue, going back to my home and go, what do I do? Go back the next day. What do I do then? When we're hearing about this, and I understand, this is my city now, man. This has been my city forever. Now I've come back and this is where I'm gonna die. But I'm bringing now community. I'm building community here. I need help building the community that you all are asking for. This is what I'm saying. I need help. You know, I'm on two or three boards. I give my, and then, you know, they dissolve the boards when you start, you know, be, I've, I have groups that come together that do make a difference in this town for the better. And then all of a sudden, you say it, 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 it's transferred over then to a, another uh, council, uh, council seat instead of to the people. The people keep losing the right to push for what they want. It keeps going to a very few. If, if I may, Mr. Yes, Garter, thank you so much. Um, and then I think, Cornell, you should weigh on this because this happens a lot. Um, in other communities, they actually have, and our code actually says that when you are doing, say, for example, a project with affordable housing, you're supposed to be fast-tracked. The problem that we have is while we can fast-track our approvals all day long, Miami-Dade County is where you end up going to and almost sort of like resting in hell for a little while. You know, while they twist and turn and charge you enormous, uh, and I know Miss Hill, you went through that with Miami-Dade County. On that a, was on a project. actually the city of North Miami. My permits waited on the desk of the city manager for four and a half months. And see, this is where, and then I'm talking about Mr. Darter, and I know you went through this with Durham. So Durham has a lot of requirements that the city doesn't. So you get stuck in Durham. Well, we can do certain things, um, and we can expedite it. Again, we are dealing with, um, in the building department, low staffing levels. Um, that's a shortage of, um, of help. Um, but there is certainly plenty of folks at the city who support what you're doing, and we try to push you through as all development through as best we can. Um, but unfortunately, there's a limitation to what we, can, what we have, um, tools we have to function. John, um, I think one of the questions for John to bring in this is that you're trying to bring a business into the city, 
And so you're stuck with all of the, these things that are happening and the, the low or the slow speed, uh, the surprises. Oh no, you need to re redesign that because of whatever. Um, they, some cities offer concierge services. Um, I've actually established this in other communities where you have a, I was actually in one city, I was called the Nexus Queen. So all, t stop laughing over there. All of the development came through me and then my job was to filter it and expedite and walk people through the process. If we had the staffing levels that we should have at the city, there's a possibility to establish a concierge position in the city that not only could help you as a development folks, right? But actually to be able to work with the CBA and the organizations. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have that staffing level. Um, but we need to start with that ordinance anyway. But in, as far as Mr. Darter is concerned, uh, we do apologize that you've been going through all of this. Um, this is the type of development, these are the type of projects that we definitely should have in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, we don't have a specific mechanism right at the moment. But I do hear, and I do, you are saying exactly one of the things that many cities want to establish is to encourage, like through John's department, economic development. This would be an economic development um, project that would be coming into the city. So would all of these CBAs that they purport to say, well, we're going to promote the job creation um, of these developments. And well, what type of, this is, goes back to what I was talking to you about earlier, the living wage, what type of jobs are you bringing into the city? Yes. Are you going to be paying them minimum wage or you know, really low paying jobs? Or can we uh, ask as a community that you, when you come into this area of the city, you're, or the city as a whole, that you do a living, you provide a living wage for your residences. So I'm sorry I couldn't give you a better answer than that, Mr. Darter. benefit for the city and it will be again a success story for the city of North Miami and I know that I'm not going to leave I'm going to finish this off I just would love the help that's all so thanks that's it so that's certainly something John hi yes <laughs> yeah so um, I'm a huge fan of these community benefit agreements all throughout Miami Dade a lot of this has happened we have to understand that this will be excellent for our community because it gives us some sort of strength to have a seat at the table. Right now, we're not even invited to the table. I have been part of developments over and over and over again in this city. And one of the most disempowering parts is a lot of times our, our money, our taxpayers' money is going in to the benefits of the developers. And yet, we're not even allowed to have an opinion about the neighborhoods that we bought into. We may have a few meetings, a little town halls, but they shut us down right away when you get into City Hall. So I'm not going to go on for a long time. I'm just going to ask two questions. One, has there ever been a community benefits agreement be successful in a city that has not already passed an ordinance it, demanding it? That's number one. And number two, is there a single council person on our dais who's willing to put this up? Because if there isn't, mm -hmm. we're just wasting our time. Mm -hmm. I have fought developers. We fought the Walmart. We fought the Wendy's. We fought a lot of what our area, and our area is this area, is considered predatory development. These are things that drive our housing prices down. These are poverty pimping businesses that do not lift up anybody in jobs. And another thing is um, as far as minimum wage, that's preempted by our state. Our community is not allowed to decide what the minimum people can get paid for their labor in this place. These are things that we need. So in order to understand if as North, as North Miami residents, if we can have a community benefit agreement, we need to understand if the leaders who represent us are willing to introduce this to our community. That is so important because a lot of our leaders have benefit agreements from developers. It's just not from the community. It's for mm -hmm. their PACs. It's from their election campaigns. Mm -hmm. right.
so there has been there has been of an, an example of an organization I know in Tampa that was able to do it without the city having an actual ordinance. Um, I haven't seen it done in South Florida yet. Um, there has been, um, I take that back, there has been um, some projects up in Palm Beach where, where it has worked out. Um, but as you stated earlier, the, the best thing we'd be able to do is have an actual, an actual um, policy or regulation at the city where it's mandatory that is, that is done. But how do, you, how do you make the commissioners do it? We got we to gotta go to them and ask them. And if they don't do what we want them to do again, I will say it again, fire that butt. You know, elect someone else who will. That's the only way, that's the only way that the, the, the staff, because the city staff is not responsible for that. The council and the mayor has to make that decision, right? So in order for, it to, in order for that to happen, we got to be a part of, the, of bringing, up, bringing it up to the, to, the, uh, to the commissioners in order to get it passed. And then I think that even though it can be, it's the same thing we do as we're doing right now with the financial institutions, and I love to use that as an example, because even though they're regulated by one of the three, the, um, one of the three federal agencies, depending on their size, when they do community benefits agreements with us, it's not mandatory that they do it, and that we, on, we, only, we can only go by the numbers that they give us, because we, we're hoping that they're doing it in good faith, but not necessarily, you know? Because the object of their game is to make money. Same with, the, same with most developers, the object of the game is to make money. But I think the only way that we can really get this passed as an ordinance, and I would love to see it do, and I would love to try to lead that, um, get it passed as an ordinance within the city. Um, I live in the city of North Miami as well. So I'm not just walking in you know, from, from somewhere else in the county. I live here. My name is Marcela Gutierrez, and I'm a resident of North Miami. And um, I'm learning a lot. Thank you for introducing this, for presenting this. A couple of things I agree with you. Thank you for, for asking my question about how do we get that ordinance passed. Uh, and I think you answered it's by lobbying our council uh, members to, to do this. So I would definitely be interested in, in, doing, in doing that. Um, but I also, um, I'm stuck with this idea of community benefit and how do we define it and what do we mean? Because I know the city of North Miami is in trouble financially. I mean, we cannot even staff the building department, so this gentleman, and we've gone through those, anybody who's ever wanted a permit has, has gone through that nightmare. So, uh, of course, it's advantageous to bring developers who are going to bring a new tax base to the city immediately get us out of trouble. But community benefit has to have a long-term view. Mm -hmm. People move and are interested in North Miami now because they want to get out of Brickell. You know? And that's something that we need to preserve. We don't want to become another Brickell community with tall buildings and high density and no parking. Mm -hmm. We want to become, stay the community that is now attracting neighbor families with children who want to live here in a peaceful community with good schools, those are the kinds of things that are improve the quality of life in communities, not more develop, de developers who are going to bring more tax, you know, uh, uh, more money to the city. So we need to look long term. We don't want to become another Brickle. We don't want to become another Sunrise. We want to keep the quality of life that we deserve. And I ask the city to, you know, and developers to keep that long-term vision and for us not to negotiate these conditional use permits that always come with, we'll give you your high density if you build us a park. That's not a compromise I want to make. I want the park and I want them to keep their buildings to a minimum height mm -hmm. so we can continue to enjoy the quality of life that attracted us to North Miami in the first place. So... What you articulated exactly what needs to go that needs to go into a community benefits agreement. That's why it's important that you participate in something like that, and um, and also that we we get the commissioners in order to to, to do an ordinance where no developer can just walk in and, and, and build what they want to build. They have to go through the community, i.e., through the that particular neighborhood, um, or maybe the, the situation affects the whole city, right? Um, that they have to go through the communities and find out what they want 
and how they and and articulate to the community what they plan to build and then be held accountable for that again whether it's 10 15 20 years down the road we want them to be held accountable for what was done we don't want it to be a short-term agreement where you know they get what they want they give us a little bit of what we want and then they're gone but at the same token, again, I'm going to say it again, if we don't stay, we got to stay participating in it. It can't be a one and done. We got to stay participating. But you articulated well what, these are the type of things that go into community benefits agreements. You'd be surprised what people ask for in, the, in community benefits agreements. Some of them are way out there, but you never know. Um. I learned about, and, and development is fine. I have no issue with development. I want smart development, and like everybody in this room, I want a, I want a seat at the table, all right? Um, Hamilton, mm -hmm. I want to be in the room when it happens. I want to be at the table, and I want to have a voice. Um, you know, it's that whole question of like, who owns the air? Who owns the sky that I look up out of my, from my single family home when I'm enjoying my backyard and I'm presently looking up at trees and sky, unfortunately, at airplanes? Okay, so we've already lost part of our sky because the FAA has taken it over. And yeah, I, I really don't want to live in Brickell for a reason. Where I get confused um, is about the master plan. And I would like to ask that in, um, first, uh, second actually. What I would like to do is say to the people in this room that I was in this room many years ago um, and we talked about a $120 million bond. Um, and we did a really good job of letting our residents know what was going on. Um, and we are capable of doing this, you guys. We've done it before. Um, we've come together. Our various homeowner neighborhood associations have come together. We've had the conversations and we've gotten the word at, out so that our residents truly knew what was going on. And I really thank city staff for helping us now be aware of some of the things going forward and how we can organize. So. Um, a question about the master plan and then a comment. So where, what, what is the use of all the hours that all of us spent going to meetings and putting on our two cents and sitting at the table of creating a master plan when we turn around and it just seems to get taken away? Um, there's two types of plans that you're talking about. One is the a master plan for the downtown and major quarters that was done. There was also a master plan for the um, train station area. It's called a mobility hub plan. Uh, the most important one is the comprehensive plan. Um, that's the guiding framework for the city, not a master plan. Although a master plan will give you, gave, came out of that master plan was some of the regulations that are in place today that govern how a corridor is developed. Um, you know, the wide sidewalks, the, the planting profiles, the so as we haven't had a lot of development on the ground yet, um, because these developments, the approval process, t as Chio will testify, the approval process is quite lengthy. And then they get into the building department and they get kind of like, uh, boom. Uh, or they get it to Miami-Dade County and it's like, Ur. So as these developments will come online, you'll start to see um, the vision that you all had talked about, the wider sidewalks the shade trees, but we, we haven't had them come in on the ground yet. The comprehensive plan is more important. We're getting ready, and I'm gonna do a plug, uh, Madam uh, Clark, I'm gonna do a plug. We just now starting the update of the comprehensive plan. We do that every seven years. That's the actual guiding document. That's the community's visioning document that is then implemented through the LDRs. While the master plan said, here's the physical form, wide sidewalk, shade trees, et cetera, et cetera. The code was reflected to change, you know, change to reflect that. 10 foot wide sidewalks on the major corridors, uh, Florida, 100% Florida native vegetation. We want shade, we want uh, walkable, connected communities. Uh, we want uh, bike paths that connect to the developments. Um, the comprehensive plan is more important because there's your vision there's what is legally binding, and that is what is implemented into your LDR. So when we start that process, the city will be announcing that because a community, a comprehensive plan is a living document. It's not static. You don't do it once and done. 
So every seven years, the state says, look, you guys, you need to, as a community, look at two things. One, it needs to, your comprehensive plan may need to be updated because Florida statute changed. For example, they now have a property rights element that is required for every community to adopt. We don't have that in there. The second is that's called peril of flood legislation. So we have to, we know that there's statutory changes that have occurred in, at the Florida <laughs> legislative level that will have to be included. We also look at changing conditions of the city. So maybe what was vision in 2007 or even 2015 may not be the vision today that the community has. So we're gonna take the, the, the public engagement piece of that to the next level. It is going to be where you have a dedicated website. In addition to all the public meetings, we're gonna have a dedicated website that's interactive where you can actually publicly comment on pieces of uh, it, ideas that come forth. What are your thoughts? What, are you, what do you wanna share? Because not all of us can go to a public, take time to come to a public meeting. But a lot of us can participate in that manner. But there'll be other, there's a lot of other ways of, but I wanted to highlight the website piece of it because I think that's what we've been really lacking is not just reaching out to churches. You know, doing the radio, um, getting the word out. I think we've been not as effective in getting and communicating as I think we could be. And I'm just speaking as the city planner. Um, and it is my personal goal, and I know it's the goal of everybody at, C at City Hall to make sure that we're communicating better with our residents. So uh, while the master plan was great, and you got some, we do have, you'll start to see the physical form showing up in the, as I said, the wider sidewalks. You can see some of it already done on 125th where the city started to do projects. Um, but as these developments finally came out of the building department and start coming online, you'll start to see some of that. But the comprehensive plan is really where I want you guys to focus on and be a part of. Um, because while these CBAs will be great, and if we can get an ordinance passed to do it, um, the comprehensive plan is your cudgel. That's the actual legal standing. Your CBAs will be an enforceable contract, but you have to negotiate that. Um, whereas your comprehensive plan lays out, hey, 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 this is what we want to see today. Um, so um, be engaged with that. So I hope that answered your question. Maybe I did too much. Well, it brought up the whole conversation, which I think is an awareness for all of us to have that that's coming and that we need to participate in that. And then we need to ask our council to actually abide by it. I mean, that's what my plan is to say, we put the energy in, let's work on the master plan. And just a note while I have the microphone, so the, the, the development that's coming, um, to the White House in, uh, potentially. Uh, when you go to the website, I just want to warn everybody that if you click on, I support this project, because you're curious, right? Like, I'm curious, what does that take you to? So it takes you to this place where you put in your name because, oh, it shows, oh, if you click here, you could get more information in the future. And you're just kind of like curious, like, hey, what is a $4 million condo going to look like? Like, come on, let me just, you will actually be sending a letter to council and mayor saying that you support the project. Yeah. So I am officially asking our planning building commission to do it. I am officially asking you to not take into consideration any online petitions or support of a project because there's no way to prove that the people that actually click that have actually spent the time reading it. So just a little Certainly. note, thank just you. To, just to know we don't do that. <laughs> thank what you. What we look at is we look at does it meet the code, have they met with the neighbors, have they had physical in-person meetings with the community, um, does it, and, and primarily what we are governed by, and I have to say that as a certified planner I'm obligated, is what does the law say? What does your code say? What does the comprehensive plan say? What does the master plan say? Um, that's what I have to abide by. And so when I make a recommendation of approval, it's really going through all of that and saying it's meeting all of that, but I f still get to fight back on these conditional use permits, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and saying, you know, the scale, the, the, even right down to how the architecture looks. It's, is this attractive, really, surely? Is that what you're, no, you can go back and do better than that. 
So I really want these, C this is why I think these CBAs are going to be really important because you as a community will know better than me who's sitting here, you know, at a desk, what do you want as a community? I can't listen to each and every one of you, can't talk individually to every one of you, but I know from uh, general discussions that we've had over, over the time, what's acceptable and what's not. But they, there are things that you're gonna ask for that another neighborhood may not, which is why I say they have to be individualized, community-driven, and when I say community, Ms. Allstead, I'm talking about that neighborhood um, in that area, maybe it's even an area broken up by an area of something. So, thank you for your, your okay. great question. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. And you're right on target, young lady. I don't know your name, but you're right on target when you talk about um, signing, clicking on links and stuff like that. Even when we come to governmental meetings, when we go to government meetings, we sign in because they bring in the platform to us. But actually, that sign in says, okay, they signed in. We had some disagreements, but we worked them out of government, so don't y'all worry about it. So they going on with their projects. So even signing in, sign in sheets when you go to big projects, like any kind of project, you're actually signing that you was in the room, they heard what you said, thumbs up, let's keep it moving. So that's for that. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so when, when you talk about what's going on, for this young man right here, I stay in his face. I make him understand, I got to get my job done before I die. And that's what you're saying. Your grandchildren need to see what you did. They can't see what you did when they take them there. When, when they talk about the law, they're only interpreting what they feel it should be. So when, when they say that, you got to be in their face, the, the planner face. So you got to make sure that planner ain't planning you out your own neighborhood. I, I, we did that in Overtown and Liberty City. We planted the people out. And then we talk about don't poll people. We don't want them by us. You was once poll somewhere. And you got to know that, you know, it's enough land on here, in this, on this earth, for all of us to coexist and let's start existing together. So when we talk about uh, uh, these benefits of package agreement, well, you got all these homeowner associations all over the place. So you actually need a, a solid trust that these, all these homeowner associations meet to make sure that when they start saying something, you got them by check. And when y'all make the roll call and all the homeowner associations come together, you can tell them, be dismissed. A vote of no confidence that moves anybody. So if we ain't dealing the way they're dealing, then we just talking. And I don't want to talk no more. I'm 59. I'm going to turn 60. When I get 65, I'm going to be in Georgia on the farm. So at the end of the day, okay, we got to hold the staff accountable, not the representative. You know why I say not the representative? Because they only listen to what the staff say. Whatever the staff, what do they call them? The, the legal person, right? Once they write it and pass it to them, it's like anybody else, they read a, because I want that. Can I have that, that platform that, that, that they call a cheat sheet or, or, or talking points? Can I have y'all talking points? Because they're good talking points. I can learn from them. So I'm just saying to keep the focus is on the staff. I would say not on the commissioners because they, you know, they don't have sense enough to come out here to deal with stuff like this. Okay, so if they ain't here, they waiting the next time to give you a chicken and a bicycle and the day's over. Thank you. Um, hi, um, I'm Debbie Davies. Hi, Miss Love. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to hear a lot of these comments, but I'm really upset at hearing how the residents and communities have input into new developments coming in because I really don't, you can shake your head, my experience, my neighbor's experience in the development across the street from our house, they were given $15 million in CRA money that nobody in the neighborhood knew about before it even went up to the planning commission. So what real input did we have? And each time something came up, it was either we were too late for that or it's too soon, don't worry, you're gonna be able to have input down the road. It really wasn't true. The developer was already given $15 million in CRA money before it even got to the planning commission. And I, you know, it, I, I'm just, I, I just can't believe that we really do have input in this city. 
Remember what I said a little earlier that um, we can only encourage them to talk to you all. There's nothing in our code that says... But you didn't have to give them $15 million in CRA money before anything about the development. I can't control the CRA piece of it, but I do understand. All I can speak to is what I can speak to. Right. Um, as I said earlier, the challenge that we have is we don't have two things in place. We don't have an ordinance that says thou shalt have community workshops. What the community benefits agreement would take care of that so you don't have to have a separate ordinance. You just have to say developments of a certain scale, developments in a certain area, um, like for example, Mr. Darter's project isn't large enough that you would want to then impose additional um, uh, requirements necessary on his development. I'm just using him as an example. Um, but developments of a higher impact, whether it's, you know, I don't know, I'm just going to make up a number, for example. Whatever the ordinance says that it, of a high impact development is. So with the CBA, it would require them to have come and negotiated and created that benefits agreement before it even came and got development approval. At this, at this point, whatever they are volunteering to do because we don't have the ability to make them do it. Um, that's why I'm really strongly supportive of these community benefit agreements. So what all these new huge developments that are getting approved by the city in these really random places that don't fit into the neighborhoods, will, will they have any, um, you know, will we get anything even from the city? The city's getting money from these developers too. Will you do anything for us to help us in our neighborhoods? I, at, at this stage, you don't have, we don't have anything that we can I know. do that. I know. I've, told, I've said this, I've said this, I don't know how many times I have explained I know, it's that. So, and it's frustrating for me right. because as a certified planner, my obligation is to make sure that people are involved in the planning process. That's my absolute, one of the requirements but we've of being been a certified planner. No, but our voices are not, it, it doesn't I, mean anything. We've just like wasted our time. I hear you. That's why the CBA will make a major difference, but you can't retroactively then go and apply it to developments that have already been approved. The, the, the statute, the, there's statutory right. things that says you cannot go backwards, right? Okay. But you can start and get that ordinance passed. That would be the very first step to do to then be able to start working with Cornell or other nonprofits to help you yeah. organize and create these community, community benefits agreement because they have to meet with you. They have to organize with you. They have to work side by side with you. Um, and that takes care of that whole issue that I have of not having, I've written, I've written requirements in other communities that said, okay, if you're gonna do a development, you have to meet with the neighborhood um, at least two times in a, cl a location close to the development. It's, it's non-negotiable and it applies to all development. Um, here we just don't have that right now. So this ordinance or a potential ordinance doing that would take care of that because you all would be part of that development approval because in exchange, you're not going to stand up there and protest the development, right? You're not going, you're going to support the development. But it doesn't matter anyhow. I mean, With a CBA, maybe, maybe the city has gotten money from these new developers. So maybe you, the city could use some of that money to help us in the neighborhood where they're approving these huge, um, you know, huge buildings that are totally out of character with our neighborhoods. I mean, the city has some responsibility here too. Well, the city, the staff's responsibility is to administer the code as it, as it is written, yeah, so right? Uh, so you're screwed and I'm screwed. So what we can do is we try to get an exchange only for those developments where we're giving them either infrastructure grants or, or density right. that they don't have. So um, we try to do our best right now, which is why I'm sitting up here in this no, panel I, I understand. encouraging this community benefits agreement. Okay, thank you. I do. My name is Evan Shields. I think I'm the last question, so I'll keep it brief. I'm a homeowner. I'm a business owner in our community. Two, a comment and two quick questions. First, the comment, 
applaud, please, our Madam uh, Clerk for such an amazing, engaging presentation and our panel as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, long overdue. Two questions. One, to the best of your knowledge in our state statute or in our code, is there anything that requires that a development have a CBA or an ordinance by the city of North Miami go out to put out a CBA, depending on the type of the development, the size, the scope, the amount of funding, the amount of investment? Because Lord knows, based off of this conversation, it'd be great to see more CBAs in our county. It'd be great to see more of them in our city. What can we actually do to keep our city and our county accountable to actually getting these CBAs done? That's the first question. The second question, and then I'll sit down, is I heard quite a bit about this being a legal agreement and accountability and making sure that we have a coalition in place. I think that was, I think those are all amazing things we need to, to keep in mind. My question though is once a CBA is in place, how do we keep it accountable? How do we keep the developers accountable to that CBA? Not only in the first year of development, but in year five, in year 10, in year 15, or whatever years uh, uh, amount of scope we have in the development. And I'm saying this, asking these questions, you know, not only as a business owner and concerned citizen, but as a small time real estate developer myself trying to do some big things like Gio said over there. So thank you so much, and I appreciate uh, everything you've said this evening. I'm going to answer the first question. I'm going to defer to Cornell on the second piece of it. Statutorily, there's nothing in Florida statute at all. Um, Florida statute has changed over time. The legislative focus has changed over time um, to be more focused on property rights. So your property rights, uh, we call them developers, but they're actually property owners. So the Florida statute looks at them the same way they look at a single family homeowner. You have property rights, we're gonna respect them. That's why I was telling you all that our comprehensive plan now has to have a private property rights element in it. Mm. Um, and there's nothing, as I mentioned, there's nothing in our code right now that says thou shall do a community benefits agreement. Um, I'm fully in support of the community benefits agreement, and, but the, as I said before, the first step to getting that in the city outside of a conditional use permit where we're asking them for certain things um, would be the pass the ordinance that says thou shall, you know, do this. Uh, Cornell, you want to ask, answer the second question? Yeah, the second question is, is that just as we spoke about earlier is the coalition has to maintain um, they have to maintain oversee, oversight of that particular project and oversight of the community benefits agreement that was agreed to. As I stated, there are legal remedies because it's a contract. It is a legal binding contract. But there are organizations, nonprofit legal organizations that will help you muddle through that and make sure that, they, that the developer is held accountable um, and, and using the power of the community and the citizens or neighborhoods in, the, in, those, in the different communities to, to oversee the, the project. Now, again, as I stated earlier, um, it can't be done as a one-off. If, if the project's 15 years, right, and, they re, and they're required to do certain things during those 15 years, then the, it's up to, the, it's up to the, the, uh, the coalition to make sure that it stays, that they stay in line and stay doing what they're supposed to be doing. Then I, I get it, that can be a long time. But that's why you keep bringing in new people and new folks in the, that come to the neighborhood as well as passing it on to your children or passing it along to relatives who to help keep the, the oversight over the, over the particular project. And if the project's not done, prepare to file that suit if necessary in order to make sure that it's done and not, be able to, and not willing to back down off of what, the, what a previous agreement because developers um, I've seen it happen. We'll come back and try to renegotiate later or try to change the agreement. And that's not what you wanted. If you desire that so many jobs be created, so many low, uh, affordable housing things be created, so many parks be created, so many green space be created, that may change, right? They may try to change it after the agreement is coming. And again, it could be due to something that is not foreseeable. 
that they did, what, didn't see, for instance, where they wanted to put that particular park on that particular part of the of the project. Now it's a brownfield, or maybe there's something there's something else wrong with it that they have to fix or not. Okay, and they may go back to the city and say, okay, well, look, we need to amend this particular permit or request a new permit or request a change of the of the plan. But you also want to be involved in that as well. You want to be able to know about that as well. So one last question yep. or one last comment. And the and and just a quick follow up to Cornell. Um, part of these, can, remember I told you the bulk of what we utilize is called a conditional use permit. If anybody wants, a developer wants down the road to modify those conditions and that conditional use permit, even without a CBA, they have, they have to come back to, for public hearings, they have to come back before Planning Commission and City Council. It's not the same as a CBA uh, because the, the monitoring is done at the city level for compliance. A CBA takes it beyond what the city would normally be uh, monitoring. Uh, things like the educational component or, um, daycare. yeah, d the daycare center, making sure that that's, that's run properly. So um, I think that's, that's about right. I have one more thought. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Isaiah, and I work for the City of North Miami under the Community Planning and Development Department. And in that department, basically my job is to help businesses open, and I pretty much assist them with the business licensing process, which like Gio mentioned, as far as building, it could be a lot, because um, I've seen that and I work with that every day. But one notable thing that I've seen just throughout working with the city for the past two years and going to planning commission meetings, BOA meetings, DRC meetings, council meetings, everything, and I've noticed we haven't really discussed how development will affect renters, which is a very big deal because I'm young, I'm 22, and it's pretty much impossible for me to even afford to live in the city that I work in, which is a lot. Um, and I've seen the term affordable housing pretty much tossed around a lot. Um, to break things down, that means pretty much a studio, 500 square feet for $1,800 starting, which I'm sure is probably more or up to par with some of your mortgages, which is an issue, of course. Um, but I just want us to be very, Um, strategic when it comes to development because development we know we love development we love to see it um, and no no thriving city pretty much will thrive without development so that's a no-brainer but it's how we work with the developers to ensure that the actual developments are actually helping the people who already live here um, and I've like I said before fortunately uh, my mom has owned our house in district 3 for the past 23 years but if I did not have that I'll be forced to leave the city because I can't afford it. Um, so I just want us to make sure that we, when we say affordable housing, maybe, I don't know, Debbie, maybe you can speak to this. Is there a way to do some sort of rent control? Because they can say they're going to do affordable housing, but I don't know how that works. Two years from now, it can be over $3,000. Um, but sorry, I get a little passionate. But, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, like she was saying, and I'm actually really glad that you had this meeting, it's important for us to be involved as residents, even as business owners, as developers. We all need to work together to pretty much accomplish the goal that the, literally the city's mission is to enhance the life of the city that we live in. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say because I know it's getting late and I, I know I need to do <laughs> stuff. All right, thank you all once again so much. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to a few folks in the room. So uh, Edwin Miller here, Mr. Miller is part of the Black Business Investment Fund and uh, that's extremely important. So I'd love for folks to connect with him if you believe you know of any black owned businesses who could benefit from some funding. Also, Dave Burney was here from the Chamber of Commerce. All you residents that are here, I think you all are the most important attendees and of course huge thank you Debbie I know you have a lot to do but you made the time to come here you even did a PowerPoint and I'm so grateful because this is so important to me John you were at a conference all day but you made the time for me I may have threatened you um, but <laughs> I'm really grateful and of course uh, Mr. Cruz Cornell we started this from the very beginning 
and it was just an idea and then it turned into this and I'm so grateful. Marlene Monestein was also, who also works with the city of North Miami as the senior planning technician, was also extremely instrumental in not only connecting us but making sure that this came to fruition. And of course my team at the office of the city clerk, please do know that the office of the city clerk is open to all of you. We will be doing a follow up so if you did sign in you'll get the information, you'll get the guide, you'll get a copy of the slide, you'll get a copy of the recording and we'll make it as accessible as possible and if there's ever any questions anything that I can help you with personally please feel free to reach out and one more time please fill out the worksheet all right oh and the chief of staff <laughs> Yama Payer thank you so much for making this happen for us and uh, officer Hippolyte in the back there thank you for keeping us safe Roberto Donneval and Gertie Genozier from the Office of the City Clerk. Albert Bazil, Director of Housing and Social Services. Karen Frederick, who is the Housing Administrator, Coordinator? Administrator. And of course, the team from um, One Show Palm, IT Media Group back here. Thank you so much for making this production possible. And Marb Language Services for the translation. Thank you all so much.